A Tower of Literary Beauty, Wordplay and Chiasmus in the Story of Babel, read by Jeffrey M. Bradshaw. Mario Laranaga produced the commanding view of ancient Babylon pictured here. The famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, is pictured in the foreground, and the ziggurat temple tower of the city, recalling the form of the Tower of Babel in popular imagination, is silhouetted in the background. In the nine verses that make up the account of the Tower of Babel, we have a short but brilliant example of Hebrew storytelling. To begin with, we marvel with J.P. Folkelman at how little room the narrator had to do his job, yet he managed to keep within the square meter. He who has something to say, and must, speaking in terms of sound and time, do so in 121 words or two minutes, or in terms of writing in space, within half a page of 13 lines, is forced to confine himself. Yet within this highly constrained setting, the author has created a literary masterpiece. Ingenious word and sound parallels between verses, ironic linkages between sections and ideas, and a beautiful economy of style are readily apparent to readers of Hebrew. In its original tongue, the prose turns language itself into a game of mirrors. Addressing the meaning of this densely packed scripture gem, Everett Fox writes of how its general message of measure for measure allotment of divine action in direct response to human hubris is transmitted by mean of means of form. Quote, the divine come now of verse 7 clearly stands as an answer to human times and identical cry in verses 3 and 4. In addition, humans who congregated in order to establish a name and to avoid being scattered over the face of all the earth are contravened by the action of God, resulting in the ironic name Babel and subsequent scattering of humanity. The text is thus another brilliant example of biblical justice, a statement about the worldview in which the laws of justice and morality are as neatly balanced as we like to think the laws of nature are." End of quote. Many scholars have noted the obvious chiastic features of the story. For example, Ellen Van Volde explains her tower model of the tower story shown here. It visually demonstrates how the city of Babel is incrementally built up by men and taken down by God. A scriptural word picture of this image is provided by Proverbs 11.11. 11. A city is built up, literally raised up, by the blessing of the upright, but it is torn down by the speech of the wicked." End of quote. Van Volde observes three interesting things about the construction of the story. First, there is an obvious parallel movement in the construction of the tower in verses 1 through 4 and its destruction in verses 5 and 7 through 9. The first half is about human actions as the story moves upward, and the second half is about the response of the Lord as the storyline descends. Note how in each verse, the first half of the story finds its parallel in the second half. Verse 1 parallels verse 9, verse 2, verse 8, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 4, verse 5. Verse 6 is the turning point of the chiasm, where the Lord states his observation and his concern. The model also shows how, remarkably, the chiastic structure within each verse in relation to its counterpart in the other half of the story. In other words, the parallel wording in each verse is laid out in reverse order from the verse with which it is paired, ABC versus CBA. Let's look at the story in more detail, step by step. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Our first question about the story arises in verse 1. Does the phrase one language necessarily imply that the same language was being spoken by every person on the globe? In response to this question, Hugh Nibley observes, quote, Just as son and descendant are the same word in Hebrew and may easily be confused by translators, who have no way of knowing save from context in which sense the word is to be understood, so earth and land are the same word, the well-known Eretz. In view of the fact that the book of Ether, speaking only of the Jaredites, notes that, quote, there were none of the fair sons and daughters upon the face of the whole earth who repented their sins, end of quote, it would seem that the common whole earth of the Old Testament need not always be taken to mean the entire globe, end of quote. It is possible that the Book of Mormon is taking a more limited view of the events than Genesis when it refers to the protagonists of the story simply as, quote, the people, end of quote. 
Moreover, in the Joseph Smith translation we read, quote, and it came to pass that many journeyed from the east, end of quote. The reference to many as the subject to the verse could be taken as implying a specific group, not every person on earth. A second question then arises, why does the verse narrator find it necessary to add the words one speech to the idea of one language? The phrase one speech means literally one set of words. Consistent with this meaning, André Lecoq translates the phrase of one speech as with a few subjects or utterances and takes it as an indication of the severe limitation of interest on part of the crowd. The subject of their discourse was narrow. They were all talking of identical things. He stresses the repetitiveness of their saying, to break bricks, to flame in the flame. They speak to no one else but themselves, end of quote. The situation can be compared to the new speak language described in George Orwell's novel, 1984. Quote, the new speak vocabulary was tiny, and each reduction was a gain, since the smaller the area of choice, the smaller the temptation to take thought, end of quote. In conclusion, the phrase one speech can be taken as meaning that the people are wholly consumed in their project, with no thought of its consequences, nor, it seems, of the God who made them. At two, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. What can we learn from the phrase, as they journeyed from the east? André Lecoq observed that the people who arrive there do it more or less accidentally, as entered by the verb nasa, to journey, typical of nomadic mobility. The phrase from the east, Hebrew mikadem, should be read in a larger context as eastward, that is, toward Mesopotamia, from an orientation point in the west. Throughout the first half of Genesis, eastward movement is repeatedly associated with increasing distance from God. The message of the narrator is that they are deliberately choosing the curse that will later come upon them. By way of contrast, a few, day, few chapters later, Abraham's return from the east is a return to the promised land and the city of Salem, being directed toward blessing. Why is a plain in the land of Shinar specifically mentioned? Shinar is in the land of Babylonia, modern, modern southern Iraq. It is an evil portent that Shinar and Babel were already associated with the name Nimrod in Genesis 10. The action of the story will take place in a valley, hardly a place for good things to happen according to the thought in ancient Israel. God reveals himself to Israel on mountains, Sinai, Horeb, Nebo, and Sion. Nothing good is expected to happen in a valley. In short, everything about the introduction to the story in verse 2 would have led an ancient reader to expect a bad outcome for the wandering group described. And they said, one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they, led, and they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. In an effort to reproduce the Hebrew more literally in English, Lecoq gives the first part of this verse as, Come, let us brick bricks, and then we'll flame in the flame. The repetition of a small number of words reinforces in the previously stated argument that there is a severe limitation of interest on the part of the crowd. The implication of the phrase is that each brick is to become wholly transformed into a burnt object, just as each participant in the project is already wholly transformed into a cog in the great wheel of the overall project. Further anticipating the disastrous results of the effort, Gordon Wenham notes that the Hebrew word for make brick, bricks for stone and to build for ourselves contain the consonants NBL, which spell mix up or babel and evoke the word folly in Hebrew. The way in which the project is introduced with the words Go to, reinforces the single-mindedness with which the building task was to be undertaken. Leon Cass explains, quote, Speech is here used by human beings to exhort to action and to enunciate a project of making for the first time in Genesis. Come, or go to, Hebrew hava, means prepare yourself, get ready to join in the mutual plan. Each man thus roused his neighbor to the joint venture. Let us make. Hortatory speech is the herald of craft, and craft enables man to play creator. God, too, had said, 
let us make. Also using the term go to in a mocking tone, James 4, 13 through 16 reminds us that our personal plans for secular success are not wholly our own. They are the business of God and subject to his sovereign will. Quote, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. End of quote. Rabbinic commentary remarks on the deplorable inversion of values that accompanied the work of building. Bricks were valued more than life itself. Quote, Many years were spent on building the tower. The ascending steps were on the east and the descending steps were on the west. It reached so great a height that it took a year to mount to the top. A brick was, therefore, more precious in the sight of the builders than a human being. If a man fell and died, they paid no attention to him. But if a brick fell down, they wept, because it would take a year to replace it. They were so intent in their project that they would not permit a pregnant woman to interrupt her work when her hour of travail came upon her. End of quote. The point of this little digression about brick as stone and slime as mortar is to explain Babylonian construction techniques in contrast to Israelite practice. The Babylonians were driven to use bricks because of the rarity of stone in their land. Kasudo hears mockery in the expression, namely, the poor creatures did not even have hard stone for buildings such as we have in the land of Israel, and which we bind together with mortar. It is also easy to hear the echoes of the contrast between the Mesopotamian structures built upon the river flood strains plains of sand and Israelite structures built upon rocky elevations within Jesus' parable of the foolish man and the wise man. Finally, consider how the execution of this project parallels the Hebrew slavery in Egypt, according to Exodus 1.14, where incidentally the word bricks and mortar are found. So even the term brick in Genesis 11 is loaded with bad memories in Israel. 4. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered upon the, abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The witless repetition of go to in this verse continues the mockery of Babylonian pretensions. So does the statement of their ambition to make a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. The idea that the top of the tower reaches to the heavens, along with the idea that the Lord came down in verse 5, gives textual confirmation that the tower is a Babylonian ziggurat. This would have been transparent to the ancient reader. To make a name for oneself means to achieve fame and renown. The phrase men of renown in Genesis 6.4, and no doubt also in Moses 8.21, literally means people of name. These verses link to Nimrod by their common reference to mighty man or mighty men, gibor or giborim in Hebrew. The desire for a name anticipates God's promise of a great name to Abraham, who serves as a counterpoint to the men of Babel. Abraham, to whom the Babylonians are being implicitly compared, does not make a name for himself. Rather, it is God who makes his name great. John T. Strong argues that the effort of the Babylonians to make a name for themselves amounts to defacing the image of God, scratching off the name of God and replacing it with their own name. End of quote. We skip over verse 5 momentarily to verse 6 the capstone of the literary tower. 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. The Hebrew word hen, behold, often is used in the Bible to introduce a rhetorical reflection occasioned by regret or sorrow. As in the reference in Genesis 10.8 to the doings of Nimrod, quote, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. The Hebrew verb halal, to begin in this verse, has become decidedly negative. Lokok sees a negative meaning of the verb started as used here, translating the phrase as, quote, 
This is what they have profaned to make. The sense is that they've started a work of evil, not a work of good. In the phrase, now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do, Lecoq sees here, correctly, an echo of God's assessment of the consequences of Adam and Eve's transgressions in Moses 4.28. Just as Adam and Eve's having become godlike in taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge required them to be restrained from also taking of the tree of life, so the people's having succeeded thus far in commencing a tower means that they must be stopped before the project reaches its conclusion. The verb for restrained to be inaccessible, in Genesis 11.6, is often taken as alluding to defensive fortifications. Now nothing that they propose to do can be defended against. That is, with such a fortified city as a base for empire, no other power will be able to withstand their imperial aggression." End of, quote. of course, God himself is not threatened by this aggression. He is, however, concerned about those who will be in harm's way if their strength goes unchecked. 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man builded. The aspirations of the builders that the top of the tower may reach unto heaven, in verse 4, are contradicted by the statement that the Lord had to come down to see it. Gordon Wenham observes, quote, With heavy irony we now see the tower through God's eyes. This tower which men had thought reached to heaven, God can hardly see, end of quote. God sees, but the people are blind. They are blind to the consequences of their ambition and blind to God's intentions. As in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God does not reveal his presence to the wicked. He is made known to them only later through his destructive actions. The phrase the children of men can be rendered the children of Adam. Nahum Sarna sees here a satirical note in the use of a phrase heavily charged with the consciousness of man's earthly origin his mortality and frailty. Unlike the temple building project at Babylon depicted in the Mesopotamian creation epic, Enuma Elish, the construction crew is staffed by ordinary men, not gods. Leon Cass further observes, quote, the term children of Adam assimilates the meaning of the project of Babel to the first activities of the first man, not only his naming of the animals, but his project of appropriating autonomous knowledge of good and bad. In Adam's individual case, autonomy, choosing for yourself, is the opposite of obedience. In the builder's case, independent self-recreation, making yourself, is the opposite of obedient dependence in relation to God or anything else. End of quote. 7. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Lecoq observes that in other passages that can be easily compared to Genesis 11.7, the sense of confound, or mix, is definitely negative. In Hosea 7.8, the Lord condemns the people of the tribe of Ephraim for mixing themselves with the Gentile nations rather than separating themselves out from among them. Isaiah 64.6 presents a confession in the first person plural in which the term confounded means to be rotten or at least to be withered. There should be no mistake that confounding is a curse, not a blessing. The phrase, that they might not understand one another's speech, might be translated as, that they will not listen to one another's speech. This translation suggests that God will make them break all relationships. This insight is crucial. God has no need to confound the people. They are already thoroughly mixed up, and that is the problem. What he needs is a way to end their work, and this can be accomplished when their one language and one speech is no longer directed single-mindedly toward their one project and their will to cooperate evaporates. 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. The Hebrew word for scatter is the same as in verse 4. The very thing that the builders feared has come upon them. Note that the story does not connect explicitly the confounding of language with the scattering. Neither the Bible nor the Book of Mormon attributes the scattering of the people to the confusion of tongues. Was such a scattering inevitable? Does the Lord oppose the concerted effort of peoples to gather and build as a matter of principle? 
Some commentators lean in this direction, taking God's edict that mankind should spread out into competing nations, languages, and peoples as mankind's final desirable end. However, Latter-day Saints know that nations are scattered as a result of wickedness, and that wickedness will not always prevail on the earth. At a per future day, the city of Enoch will return to the earth. That holy city will unite with the prepared people on earth who are of one heart and one mind, not because their speech is repetitively narrow, but because their souls embrace the expansive expressions of righteousness. 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. The story ends with an additional ironic twist. The desire of the men of Babel to make a name for themselves come to naught with anonymous infamy, but the ruined city gets a name. Michael Fishbane observes a clever Hebrew pun in the idea that, quote, the very bricks out of which the tower of human pretension is constructed are themselves symbolically deconstructed and reversed when God babbles the language of all the earth and scatters the builders of all the earth. The words, Hebrew words are reversed. In an effort to capture the sound play of the Hebrew, Hebrew passage in English, Robert Alter gives the following translation. Come, let us go down and baffle their language. Therefore it is called Babel, for there the Lord made the language of all the earth Babel. The story of Babel has never been more relevant than it is today. The expanding global monoculture replicates with cold precision the essential conditions for human projects in the style of Babel to sprout and flourish. Paying homage to the 1563 work by Peter Bruegel the Elder, Julie Holcomb's Tower of Babel is built of collage digital image of various buildings from crumbling cheap housing to neoclassical palaces and taught by skyscrapers reaching for the heavens. According to the artist, Babel Revisited takes an allegorical gaze at history and modernity and how human beings, like nature, are doomed to the continual repetition of what has gone on before." End of quote. Andre Lecoq concludes that the author of Genesis 11, quote, wants his readers to realize that, among other things, they participate in Babel's building. Babel then becomes the symbol of all our constructions and fabrications, with their inexorable outcome, confusion of our life messages, and scattering of all the pieces of our projects." End of quote. In light of the scattering of the Babylonians, Leon Cass poses these penetrating questions, quote, Did the failure of Babel produce the cure? Has the new way succeeded? The walk that Abram took led, led ultimately to his biblical religion, which by anyone's account is a major source and strength to Western civilization. Yet standing where we stand, at the start of the 21st century, more than 3,700 years later, it is far from clear that the proliferation of opposing nations is a boon to the race. Mankind as a whole is not obviously more reverent, just, and thoughtful. And internally, the West often seems tired. We appear to have lost our striving for what is highest. God has not spoken to us, speaking of the Western civilization collectively, in a long time. <clears throat> the causes of our malaise are numerous and complicated, but one of them is too frequently overlooked. The project of Babel has been making a comeback. Whether we think of the heavenly city of the philosophes or the post-historical age to which Marxism points, or more concretely, the imposing building of the United Nations that stands today in America's first city, whether we look at the internet, or the globalized economy, or the biomedical project to recreate human nature without its imperfections, whether we confront the spread of the postmodern claim that all truth is human creation, we see everywhere evidence of the revived Babylonian vision. Can our new Babel succeed? And can it escape? Has it escaped the failings of success of its ancient prototype? What, for example, will it revere? Will its makers and its beneficiaries be hospitable to procreation and child rearing? Can it find genuine principles of justice and other non-artificial standards for human conduct? Will it be self-critical? Can it really overcome our estrangement, alienation, and despair? 
Anyone who reads the newspapers has grave reasons for doubt. The city is back, and so too is Sodom, babbling of dissipating away. Perhaps we ought to see the dream of Babel today once again from God's point of view. Perhaps we should pay attention to the plan he adopted as the alternative to Babel. We are ready to take a walk with Abram.